Greetings, everyone. I'm John Farkas, and your host for Healthcare Market Matrix. I'd love to welcome you to our show today. And, uh, and we're just going to rewind a little bit here. Late in February, uh, I, like many of our listeners, was at the Vive Conference in Los Angeles, and there was a bit of a dark cloud looming over the conference at that point, because just at that moment, days before, uh, Change Healthcare, which is part of the United Health Group, got hit by a major cyber attack that has since stirred up quite a storm across the U.S. healthcare ecosystem. And let's just be clear, it was not just a small hiccup, it was huge. Uh, a group called Alpha Black Cat, now a notorious ransomware gang, has uh, claimed responsibility for this attack. They managed to snag millions of Americans' healthcare info, which is obviously having major implications. And the fallout has been really messy. Hospitals and pharmacies have not been able to process claims or prescriptions, basically gumming up the works for a lot of providers and patients alike. Um, and right now, the HH HHS has stepped up trying to cushion the blow for healthcare providers with some quick fixes, and they're urging payers to help out too. Uh, United Health Group is in major damage control mode. They've got their electronics uh, payments mostly, I guess, back up online, and they've been uh, shelling out billions of dollars to help providers uh, stay afloat during all this chaos. It has been a real wake-up call for needing to beef up cybersecurity and healthcare, and uh, and for sure, the downstream effects are really going to be substantial. And uh, those effects are what we're going to be talking about and exploring today. And to do that, we are welcoming into the healthcare market matrix studios, some experts in the revenue cycle universe. And so I'm uh, excited to again introduce to you Trish Rivard. Uh, Trish has, is a uh, now veteran of our podcast, but she's a member of Ratio's advisory board. And she's the CEO of Eliciting Insights. They're a healthcare technology market research and strategy company that's bringing together just amazing amounts of experience and expertise in the revenue cycle universe and other areas, doing some deep collaborative work right now with HFMA, uh, doing some combined reports that are really bringing some strong insights across to, uh, to folks in this space. And, uh, and I know that uh, she's got some, some uh, experience back with, uh, in her backdrop with our one and and shall and share some resume DNA with our other guest, which is going to be uh, my segue in or, into introducing Ben Regal. And Ben is the CEO of Tarpon Health, and Tarpon is a community of providers that are building their own internal automation, and we're, and they're working together. Ben's helping facilitate some collaborative working together and support. Uh, to inform each other about the process, which is not for the faint of heart and something that is becoming more and more essential in this realm every day. Um, Ben's also the host of another great podcast that any of you interested in the RCM space should tune into. It's called My Good Friends. It's the uh, and part of the RCM Leaders Forum, which you can check out wherever great podcasts are available. Um, and the RCM Leaders Forum... Ben is doing some great work to gather some of the top healthcare system RCM innovators to get together and talk about the world and all that is in front of them. And, uh, and so obviously our topic today is front page news for that group. And, uh, and these two have been spending a lot of time looking at what the implications are. And, uh, and so today we're going to be diving into that and talking about what do we need to know, how we need to be considering the impact as, as the, our audience looking at helping lead healthcare technology solutions and move that into the market? What do we need to be knowing and being aware of that are going to be some of the ecosystem impacts and things that are going to need to affect our efforts as we engage the market? So, Ben, Trish, welcome to Healthcare Market Matrix. Thank you for having us. So... Uh, I, I'd love to, you know, we're hearing tons about this breach, right? I mean, it's it's obviously uh, a major major deal. Just walk us through the timeline 
of what happened there and what we need to, you know, it's a pretty fascinating series of events. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot of, uh, of what to do and what not to do that can be extracted from what happened. But I'd love, uh, I'd love for you guys to kind of walk us through the anatomy of, uh, of the events there. Well, I've done a lot of work on this. Trish has done more research on just what's, you know, what's happening currently. I've tried to piece together because I was, as I told you, John, I was on vacation. <laughs> so this happened. I was on vacation and I'm sure Trish would say the same thing. I thought, oh, this will be, I'll figure this out in a couple of days. Like I got back and, and then I got back to my email and I was going through my email and I had a bunch of my community leaders, big health system, VPs of cycle, email me and say, hey, can you pull uh, like a town hall together? I did these town halls in like the pandemic. Just pulling people together is kind of like a therapy session because <laughs> we didn't know what to do, right? Like, the, like if everyone remembers, kind of like March, February of of uh, 2020. Um, and so I was like, I guess, like I didn't realize it was that big of a deal. So this is like Tuesday, the week following. By Wednesday, I had 45 health systems join a call, like less than 24 hours. Wow. And we got on that call and it was clear. A couple of things were clear. One is um, that change reps were calling um, our health system leaders and asking questions that they should know the answer to. And so it was like instantaneously realizing these guys don't have access to any of their data. And so the next day, which is like a Thursday, I had heard from a friend who had talked to someone on the inside at change and had confirmed that they did not have access to their laptops. And actually, I still don't think they do. Um, and so they couldn't access anything. They couldn't access their own data. That was, was all shut down or lost. And that the the infiltrator, Black Hat, actually didn't just get data, which should be, you think, would be the primary, <laughs> primary thing um, that people would be worried about, is actually what they did was they got the data and they, um, what we can understand is they were able to get what they call root admin access and actually delete and destroy some of the programs. Uh, roughly a hundred and some programs were affected. And that was the bigger problem is that they just went in and kind of damaged things. Yeah. So they, that, they didn't just take what was in the pipes. They screwed right. up the pipes. Correct. <laughs> so on their way out, they're like, screw it. We're going to like, we're going to do whatever we're going to do. And my guess is they probably just, you know, like people are like, well, did they target the clearinghouse? I'm like, no, they probably literally just ran up into the system and they were like, oh, what's, what's, what's all this data? Because clearinghouse would have had the largest amount of data by far. It wouldn't have been close. Um, and so they probably just ran up against it, took all the data and then just did whatever they did. Um, by that Friday, change had another, you know, by that Wednesday, change had moved from daily updates to bi-weekly updates, which is already a sign that was like, this isn't going to get fixed in a couple of weeks. By Friday, they were telling people, um, you need to move to another clearinghouse. And what's interesting is all during all this time, only thing in the news is about the pharmacy. And the pharmacy was a major problem because that could affect patients. That's really quick effect, right? People, yeah. Really immediate effect. Everyone yeah. can feel that. But the bigger impact really was that pain hospitals, big health systems, and everyone else, physician groups and the like, couldn't get claims paid. out. <laughs> right. And so, Trish, what is it, 30% of roughly the health systems in the U.S. Yeah, so, have changes yeah. as their yeah, clearinghouse? Yeah, Change Healthcare is the largest clearinghouse for both hospital and for physician. When we Last time we read the market share, it's a little bit dated, but we had Change Healthcare at about 30% of hospital claims and 30% of physician claims. That's significant and by far the largest of any um, player in the right. market. And what wasn't well known then, but is well known now, <laughs> was that change is actually the intermediary for a number of uh, plans, payer plans. And so, and change has never put out a list of those by to this date, by the way. <laughs> so, so MDN actually put out a list of like, here's all the plans that are payers that are affected, which was a problem because those payers couldn't A, accept claims and B, they couldn't get payments out. 
So they couldn't even send payments if they wanted to, because it was, you know, like most people don't realize all oh, this is electronic now. Almost no one's sending paper claims until the last six weeks. And they're certainly not receiving paper checks. So we did another town hall the next week. And what we started hearing was people were getting paper checks sent them in the mail, which is great. But if you're a big health system, you haven't kind of you haven't cashed a check in like long time. I don't know, Trish. <laughs> how far you want to go back? 10, 15, 20 yeah. years? You know, like it's been a long time. Like they don't even know they're getting checks. Yeah. And where are those checks going to? Like, what address are they <laughs> where going those to? checks going to? Yeah. Right. Big, big, big mess. So that Friday, they tell people to call. Like, you're going to have to seek other means of doing another clearinghouse. Fast forward to the next week, we have another town hall. We kind of hear what people are trying to do. They're sending paper claims. They're using a thing called Availity, which another company does um, can take some of those um, in batch to different payers, doing direct submissions to payers where payers could take those. But again, those have problems because you're trying to keep track of all these claims and think like millions and millions and millions of claims per health system, right? This isn't like, oh, we're sending through like a couple hundred thousand. This is like- it's like all of them. <laughs> yeah, it's like, all, it's like all of them if you're a health system. And by the next Friday, they said, no, 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 wait, 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 don't do that. We're we're going to fix this. And they got in front of, they got called in front of the White House, right? Like they, the CEO of United Health Group actually got called in front of the White House to like- meet with HSS leaders and have to give a date in which they could have this fixed. Well, they gave it to March 18th, which up until that point, they had literally told no one they could even fix the problem. <laughs> so so they, they then tell people like, oh, it's going to be fine. Well, at this point, people are already switching clearinghouses, which to give some idea, Trish lived this world. This isn't even something that people would consider to do within a six-month time frame, let alone – like a six week time yeah. frame. So switching clearing houses is one of the most painful things to do. And most providers actually wait until they switch EMRs because in order to switch your clearing house, <laughs> you have to re-enroll with every single payer. So for, for whatever, that's the way our healthcare system is designed. And that happens really fast. Yeah. So, um, so you have <laughs> yeah. to go through this enrollment process <laughs> specific to your clearinghouse. So you can't be enrolled to submit electronic claims or enrolled to receive electronic payments and then switch clearinghouses. No, you have to re-enroll with a new clearinghouse. And that process typically takes between 30 days and 60 days for the enrollment. And then, of course, you know, every and especially the smaller pairs, yeah. right, Trish? I mean, this is mostly the, the medium sized, yeah. smaller pairs. So you get this process going through, right? So there, there's just so much here where it's like, okay, now we can't get claims out. And so then what starts to happen is HSS comes out with, like, you know, we're going to, you know, they're getting all angry. They're all going to, you guys need to do your part. And but the problem is they really have no, con no they don't idea. have power here. Yeah. <laughs> so, the challenge is they don't really have power except over the Medicaid Advantage plans. And so the Medicare Advantage plans, they have some power there because they, you know, they're the payer, right? Ultimately, like the the other payer plans are just the intermediary. But like most times they don't really have power. And so they when they came out with this statement, I I laughed at it. I honestly just was laughing because I was like, this is useless. You you you're not helping anybody by doing this, yeah. right? Because it doesn't really affect the total of what's going on. So you have this, and then Optum comes out. Optum's like this other company, which is kind of in the United Health Group owns, which is what really bought change. And Optum comes out with this, like, we're going to pay people on a loan basis so that we can pay them advance payments. But then people got it, and this was also a town hall, and people were like, they were laughing out loud when they got their, like, email of, like, what they could get because it was, like, one house doesn't told me they got 0.05% of their net revenue in the, in the offer. 0.05 percent he's like this isn't That's even not like quite the administrative expense <laughs> it wouldn't cover anything <laughs> like and then there was there's been the couple of posts that went on linkedin that was like a, a physician group that got like a thousand dollars or something and she's like my payroll is sixty five thousand this week so there's also like strings attached to that money too right like one of the little things one of our hospitals found was that in the if you signed that and you got the money you took the advance payment you had Optum had the right to open up all their contracts and change the language on you. Wow! And to go renegotiate all the contracts, which is crazy. Like so, no, one, like no one in the right mind was going to sign those things. Um, and so they, I think they've come back and probably, you know, walked back a bit on that once people figured it out. But it was those type of things where you're like, what are you talking about? The other hard part was because we had health systems that were doing both. One was waiting 
They were waiting it out, trying to send their claims the way they could, but not switching. And then we had probably the other half was just absolutely just like switching as fast as possible. And so, so then you're like, well, which one's making the right decision? And I still like I was talking to my group, this, my, several of my leaders this morning, and it's all over the map where one is moved back to the original change product, but they're only getting so many so many payers are accepting it. One is on, um, you know, like still not doing anything like one is changes kept pushing their date back. Others have just completely moved. It's all over the place. And partly because there's no guidance. So there's a whole lesson around here around communication and like what was happening as far as what they were communicating out because it kept changing and no one was going to grow the real answer, which we still haven't heard the real answer of what really happened. Yeah, it, it reminded me a lot about what happened when the a, a couple winters ago when the big storm hit Texas and all of mm -hmm. a sudden the power grid went down and we all we all together started confronting the inter interconnected nature of our <laughs> of our power grid that was having implications all over the place not just the not just ground zero and and it, it it's similar to uh it's similar to that right like we're now getting educated together on just how uh codependent this framework is that we've been living in right now and we're having to figure out okay that's not a good way to do it what are we going to do about it so maybe it would be good to just jump back and say okay <laughs> for for those who just don't live in this world all the time what is change healthcare let's take a look at the the scope of what they do and why this ends up being a little bit of a uh, codependent quagmire. Um, so yeah. there's a number of different elements. Yeah. So uh, as, as Ben mentioned, so change healthcare is a, a clearinghouse, right? So, um, you know, in this day and age, and that well, means lots of different, lots of different technologies, yes, lots, lots yes. of different technologies, but every hospital, every provider needs to submit claims electronically and they have a, a clearinghouse vendor. Um, and typically there's one, there may be several, but there's one primary um, that they use to submit claims electronically and then receive electronic remittances. Um, Change Healthcare, as Ben mentioned, is also the front end gateway for about 8% of the payers out there. We think it's 8%, like Ben said, but we don't know the you know exact exact number, <laughs> kind of a you know little right. industry secret right now. Um, and then Change Healthcare also offers a whole suite of revenue cycle solutions. So they offer um, eligibility checking for health systems. They have a lot of traditional, you know, revenue cycle um, products for, um, you know, pre-service, you know, helping to register the patient. Then they have a lot of back-end revenue cycle related solutions for following up. And then Change Healthcare also operates a pharmacy called Clearinghouse, call it Pharmacy Switch, depending on who you talk with. Um, and that was what, as Ben mentioned, that was what was in the news. Yeah. Um, the pharmacy switch went down for Change Healthcare. And that is currently somewhat restored. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, the Wall Street Journal or New York Times, you know, everybody thinks it's all set. Everybody thinks it's back to normal. It's not. Um, but patients are getting prescriptions. And so that's why, you know, it seems like the, you know, spotlight from a mainstream media has come off of Change Healthcare. Um, change Healthcare. Yeah, safe to say nothing's back to normal yes, right now. exactly. When but it's not. Um, change functioning at some level. Yeah. Change Healthcare was acquired by Optum slash United Healthcare in the fall of 2022. Um, there was a lot mm -hmm. of you know industry concern about these mega mergers and everything. And quite frankly, I um, I was surprised. You know, as a you know former clearinghouse person, I was really surprised that the um, DOJ approved it because essentially what that did. Um, so I'm, I, I do have to question whether the regulators understood what they were doing. Um, they really, kind of really fully understood the scope of, of what they were allowing. But Change Healthcare, being part of United Healthcare, United Healthcare is the largest uh, private health insurance company, and yeah, United they, Healthcare, they through its acquisition of Change Healthcare, now has access to rates of 
every single one of their competitors. Because when you process remittance advices, that includes the actual amount paid for every single service. So, you know, in terms of the the scope um, of change healthcare and the reach of change healthcare, this is significant. Um, and the fact that it's now part of United Healthcare is that much more significant in terms of the role it plays. It was a big deal at the time, and it was like fought heavily by the hospitals. AHA, everybody was fighting that that acquisition to the point where they then there's a, a week prior, I believe, to the actual breach, there was another like DOJ filed another potential lawsuit or around it. Like they went back at it at basically right before the breach, realizing that it's a, it's a total conflict of interest to, to have, be a payer, the largest payer in the U S and now the largest company, mind you, the yep. largest healthcare company in the United, in the United States. And also owning a bunch of the data parts of this other third party process. It, it made no sense at the time. And now look at it. And I actually think my opinion is that if change had been independent, we would have gotten a totally different type of communication. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, they I were, they were, that. they probably had a whole lot of crisis communications conversations going on that were, com- I can't even were, <laughs> were, were, were each end was conflicting against the other because yes. there's there, the, the agendas were very, were very different. Well, one, I got the to clearing house alone, was, John is $180 million business. Yeah. So at some point it became clear it was business preservation. That's the agenda. And I get it. I, if I'm, I'm a business owner, I totally understand it. Uh, and, and I always, I preface everything with like change is a victim here. Like it could have happened to anyone, but definitely I think the United health group acquisition and being the parent owner, it definitely affected what, how it's come out. I, I can't, yeah. I can't acknowledge, I say that it, it couldn't, that it hasn't had a good Yeah, and it, it could, it, the fact that it was owned by United Healthcare could have, you know, raised the, uh, the likelihood of it being the target, um, you know, for the hackers could have made it more interesting. Possible. What, what's yeah. really, um, what, what we get a kick out of on the Elicity Insights team is that, um, as soon as the um, acquisition went through, um, United's acquisition of Change Healthcare, Change Healthcare was re- rebranded as Optum. And the Change Healthcare name kind of disappeared. And then as soon as the breach happened, all of a sudden it was Change Healthcare. It was like, like oh, it's you know, a, lot of, a lot of PR work was spent on, let's let's reinvigorate mm-hmm. that name and let's show that it was Change Healthcare. <laughs> it wasn't Optum and it wasn't United Healthcare. It was you know this asset that we purchased yeah oh i mean you know we don't really know much about it it's yeah. weird <laughs> so so um okay so certainly like i said just kind of this inter- interesting codependent quagmire that we're we're facing right now and not getting the kind of communication we need because an organization is at odds with itself and how they are needing to bring things together so the transparency has not been what it's needed to be and uh and so it's made it hard for everybody in and around it to get the 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 information that's needed to adequately navigate and uh, move things forward is that safe to say yeah there's a lack of information Mm -hmm. and then there's miscommunication so if you're a provider you don't know like when they when they do communicate should i even listen to what they're saying like i you know at this point it's it's just Mm -hmm. been um there's there's a lot of distrust here right now. At one point, John, they, I told Trish they like three weeks ago, like two weeks after it happened, they were like they put up marketing team put out something that said like eighty percent of claims are being routed rerouted and being functionally sent through. They put that out mm-hmm. as marketing, and I and I was like, there is no a you don't even know, so I don't know how you'd ever know that answer because it's not running through you. So it's like, we know yours isn't working. So it's not running through you. So there's no way you could actually know that. And so then don't, don't tell people that And 80% is a pretty round number. So I'm pretty sure we just made that up. <laughs> don't, you can't bring that stuff out. It's not helping anybody. So it's like those kind of things that were coming out and you're like, you can't say stuff like that. That doesn't mean anything. So let's, let's push toward the, what we know about the impact. And I know, Trish, you have been doing a lot of, uh, you've been asking a lot of folks in the provider side of the market, what is this meaning to you? And what are the implications? Um, 
Well, let's start with what you're learning from the providers. And, and let's just let me back up a second and say um, there's a pretty easy po- way for you all to get some direct insight. And I'm, Trish has published, made public some reports that have some really helpful uh, statistics to give some context. And I think for mm-hmm. anybody who is uh, selling into the provider space right now to have a good understanding of what this means is important because it's going to affect it, it's going to affect our world for some time still because this is this is not a small ripple. Um, so Trish, start by telling us if somebody is wanting to to get up their um, to get their hands on what you've published around this. What's the best place for them? Yeah, to Yeah, sure. So our market pulses. So today we published three market pulses in conjunction with the HFMA. And they're all available on the Eliciting Insights website. They're available for free. Um, just go to the Market Studies tab. You can download them. The other thing I'd like to um, recommend as well is um, highly recommend you follow Ben Regal on LinkedIn because he's been publishing a lot from his town halls of what he's hearing um, from providers as well. Um, you know, and then in, in terms of the impact, so I'll, I'll get started and then pass it over to Ben. But in terms of the impact, you know, I think from a provider standpoint, you know, you can't get your claims in, you're, you're getting paper checks, you're getting um, the remittances, you're going to the parent website and you're pulling them, your cash is slow. So, you know, first and foremost is um, providers are, exa- and you know, change healthcare's, you know, quote unquote line of credit is a joke. And the payers aren't the payers aren't helping. The payers aren't saying, you know what, we normally pay this hospital two million dollars a week. Let's you know, let's just you know pay them you know two million, a million and a half. Just you know keep the doors open for them. Payers aren't doing that. Like you know they're just sitting on the cash and saying, oh, that would be really hard to do. Um, yeah, it'd be administratively challenging. You know things to think through, but it's been done before. So um, you know. But from a provider standpoint, cash, cash is a big problem. You know, line of credit, we all know interest rates are high. Prime is currently sitting at about eight and a half percent. This is this is a significant cost. And then the cost to run revenue cycle, the costs overtime costs are really high right now. So if you're manually posting every single remit by hand. I mean, that's that's a lot of expenses, um, you know, looking for other ways to submit your claims. Like Ben said, dropping things to paper. Some payers don't even accept claims you know, by paper. So the you know, the, the staff time to just try to figure out solutions, viable solutions and, you know, do things through paper processes. I mean, this is all very expensive and it's consuming and health systems are most health systems out there are not for profit. So they're not sitting on a ton of cash. So this is, I mean, this right. is problematic. It's a and um, you know, the, the concerns are, um, you know, what, what does this mean for staffing? What does this mean long-term for patient care? If this doesn't get resolved quickly, um, patient statements, we know patient statements are going to be delayed. And the longer it takes you to get a statement out to the patient, the less likely they are to pay. So there's, there's a lot of implications and there's going to be a lot of cleanup that's, you know, even, you know, you know, if the clearinghouse turns on tomorrow for change healthcare and it were, you know, fully functional and running like it should be, it would take providers Six still months. weeks to dig out of this. Yeah. I've said from the very beginning that actually the biggest impact isn't the bigger health systems are going to figure it out. Like they have enough cash typically on hand and in reserves. They're going to either move to the nether clearing house or they're going to figure it out. They have the, they have resources. It sucks. It's awful. It's terrible. I've said from the very beginning, the biggest challenge actually is that physician groups and smaller community hospitals are screwed. They have the biggest chance of actually just flat out not being able to continue functions because they don't get the same priority. If I go to like another vendor, <laughs> they're not getting priority over, you know, Henry Ford or Advocate. Like those are enormous health systems or Providence, yeah. right? Like these are these are going to get priority over everybody else. And they, they're coming system, from a already compromised spot. Right? Correct. They, they, and they probably the, don't have <laughs> they don't have a ton of staff and they probably don't have like a ton of days cash on hand. And, and even if they did, it's still like it's significant impact. I think I think those are the groups that are like they're kind of left to who are the devices of 
of the whims of that. And that's the groups that I think the government should have stepped in sooner and been like, here's what we're doing. And if you're this size and you're this, like, here's the loan you can take, or here's the advance payment or whatever they needed to do. And that's actually what they've not done. I, I'm still shocked by this, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when COVID hit four years ago, they did the it government immediately almost. knew there was going to be a significant impact to the provider community. And now it feels like the government knows and they can't, can't push United Healthcare to do anything. They can't push the payers to do anything. So they're taking this really weird position right now. Yeah. Yeah. Which in some sense, it, it, well, in some sense, it ought to be, ought, ought to be a step more apparent than what happened with COVID because it's directly about the pipeline, right? I mean, it's just saying you're not getting paid. And it, and, and so, that seems a little different than we're not sure. Yeah, but COVID how. was about illness. COVID was an actual illness. Yeah. And so they knew yeah. the health system, right? This is like kind of nebulous. Well, some are affected, you know, and it's like, well, it seems like they should figure this out. Like, this will like, so, so run its course. I'm like, maybe, yeah, and maybe, you know, hopefully it will. Hopefully it will run its course. Yeah. So, but we are at this point past a month of this being an issue. And it's still an issue, right? It's not like there there's still mop buckets out and they're <laughs> they're trying to get the water off yeah. the floor because it's still it's still yes. a wet and mess. Often, and there's still another outlying outlying issue that no one's really talking about is the fact that, that data is still out there. So they got six terabytes of data, they paid the ransom, and the this is a, you can't make this stuff up. Those two guys, the two leaders of that, a black cat took off with the money. And so they got another post that came out. I didn't tell this part of the story that was like, hey, we were the actual pe people that were working on this breach and we have your data and they talk about their money. So United Healthcare did pay or Optum did pay $22 million in ransom. That was confirmed. Yep. In Bitcoin. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And then there's, that data is still out there. So, A, that's the largest HIPAA, would be the largest HIPAA violation uh, breach in history, if I'm not mistaken. And we, in theory, would have to notify every single one of those patients, which, Church, I think the estimates are what, a, a third of the population in the U.S. Yeah. would have some type of breach? Well, yeah, so the, which, way that, the way that I, uh, I I tell my, you know, my neighbors and my family is if you've been to the doctor in January or February of 2024, you've been to the hospital, you've been to a physical therapy appointment, you've been to the dentist, you've had any procedure, you've gone for an x-ray, you've gone for an MRI, you've basically done anything in a medical setting, there's a good chance that your data was breached. So, there's a good chance. You know, um, I, I think we all just need to assume our data was breached. You know, unless we hear yeah, otherwise. so twenty-two million dollars in ransom, and who knows how much in continuing black market profits from selling off the the data that they get to sell off in those strange uh, Tor networks that uh, where they where all that stuff ends up being marketed. Um, I just was listening to some information about that this morning. Um, yeah, so, and I don't know anything about that world. That's not yeah, a world I understand. Well, I'm glad to hear I, that. Ben. Yeah, <laughs> but, and there was an article. <laughs> but it is. But it's like the thing that we're not talking about still, right? Because it's like it's just sitting out there. Those guys are saying they own it still. No, it's so not. It's not sitting, like, it, like it's not they got just it back. sitting out there. It's it's an asset for some. It's an well, asset so, for and somebody. Then the, yes. then the question is, it become who's responsible for notifying the patients? Right. So so now right. providers where, you know, they're running overtime and, you know, they're taking out loans yeah. and maxing out their lines of credit. Are they going to bear the responsibility for notifying patients because it's considered their patients? I mean, this that really bothers me. That really bothers me that, yeah. um, you know, that a patients haven't been notified and then B, that there's even a consideration that providers are the ones that are going to have to be responsible for um, for the notification. OK. So it's a big muddy mess. I'm a healthcare technology company that uh, that has some touch into. Well, I mean, any healthcare technology is going to be involved in this somewhere somehow because they're all touching data. They're all selling into health systems. You know, not all, but many are selling into health systems that are severely affected. What do I? 
as a marketing expert, as somebody trying to communicate to the market, what do I need to know? What do I need to be carrying forward? What's the sensibility I need to have? What do I need to be putting forward? How do I need to be talking about my data? You know, all of those things. Um, What are the downstream impact for the folks who are part of the healthcare market matrix community? So one of the things that we found in the last market study we did of of CFOs is that hospitals and health systems are spending a lot on cybersecurity. So they're spending, I mean, this is this kind of like a slap in the face to, you know, the health systems and the providers, you know, they have to um, spend all this money and then they work with a third party vendor and the third party vendors like, oops, you know, so, um, you know, and, and not only is it cybersecurity that they're spending on, but they're also spending money on cybersecurity insurance, right? So from a health system standpoint, there's going to be a lot of scrutiny for third party vendors coming in. And before you even have a conversation, I think there's going to be a let's see what your policies, your procedures are. We want to know that the data is secure from the second that it leaves us. So the pipes that connect with you, as well as we want to understand your infrastructure. Are you, you know, using AWS? What are you using? So we know it's secure. And then when the data comes back, we need to know that it's fully secure. So don't have a conversation with us until we know that. And then I think from a data standpoint, there's going to be, um, if I'm a health system, I'm going to say, you know what? Epic may not have the best solution, but it never leaves Epic. So maybe I should just use the Epic vanilla solution for RevCycle for clinical care. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I think it's going to be really hard for vendors that, you know, most vendors do you need the, the data to move in and out. And if you don't have a tight story, um, it's going to be really hard. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Cybersecurity just became the number one priority for a CIO and even maybe the CEO. Yeah. So so what to hear Overnight. here is that that if if how you handle data has not been a primary part of your message, it's need at least for the foreseeable, it's you've got to fly it farther forward. And and if you don't have something that's worth bragging about, you need to go figure out how you're going to put something together that's worth bragging about because uh, it's going to be it's going to be under tighter scrutiny and and so uh, as a as an organization if you if there are some holes in your data uh, protocol you're going to want to fill those quickly and diligently and then talk about it um, because that's going to be on. That's going to be pretty front and center for anybody who's ha- having healthcare data flow through your pipes in any form. Yep. Is that a fair oh, absolutely. summation? Absolutely. Yep. Or changing your whole process to be it's using data within their system, your things on their system. I know some groups that have like totally switched around how they're even doing it. They're not getting data anymore. They're like putting it on their system on their data like within their own network. Yep. So they're not even, and they're never leaving. So you're going to see all kinds of stuff like that, I think happen where it's, it's definitely going to slow it down. And I think before you'd be like, Oh yeah, we're certified or we're this and we have this. It's like, no, 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 you're going to go through whole audit process and quality processes, my guess. Whereas that wasn't commonplace before. Yeah. And so being ready to, move into a more rigorous posture or communicate the rigor of what it is that you're doing um, so that you, the health system doesn't feel like they have to do it for you. Um, but also just being ready to to have that light sh- shown on that part of your process is going to be really important. Um, talk about the revenue implications, you know, and and what this might mean for the innovation ecosystem. <laughs> Well, in the short term, <laughs> I mean, in the short term, I think it puts it puts projects on hold. I think if they're feeling the pinch at all with, you know, seeing days cash on hand drop significantly, uh, if I'm the CFO, I'm saying, look, we're not doing anything at this point. We're holding steady because they were already just coming out. You have to think about a little bit of history here in the pandemic in the first couple of years. In 2021, they actually had decent years because we were getting they were getting compensated for you know care that was COVID. Then that stopped. Almost every single health system in 22 was losing money significantly. In 23, I'd say probably 70% of them were, or maybe 60%. 
Right, Trish? I mean, you're not disagreeing yeah, with me on this. So, like, in 23, it was really like, okay, none of those 2019 volumes are coming back. Like, this is a little, no, like, probably not well thought through the thing of, like, in healthcare, some CFOs thought, like, 2019 would return. Well, those people are gone. Like, your sickest patients, I hate to say it, this is, like, morbid, but they they didn't make it through. And so those patients were going to, like, we won't see 2019 volumes for a while. So the volumes actually dropped pretty significantly. And so they had to adjust they had to adjust everything. So 23 was a year, I would say, of like trying to figure out how to make money again, which I would say most of them figured it out. So then you get to 24 and you're like, OK, we're like, we're going to be good. I was just talking to CFO friend of mine in Big Health System and he's like, OK, we're coming to 24. I feel like we're on the right path. We're getting we're getting to two or three percent my operating margin, which for health systems is not bad. And then we got a and, gun punch. <laughs> and they just got punched in the gut, right? So you imagine being like, okay, well, we're doing the same things. Stop everything that we don't have to until yeah. we can be sure that we're going to get stuff out. I mean, we knew I knew a health system that was holding $9 billion in claims. Yeah. 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 Just think that through just a yeah. little bit. <laughs> Nine billion dollars. Like that's not and it Cody that's not has a, been that's putting not out. rev cycle, that is rev uncycle. <laughs> uncycle. That's we're not cycling yeah. anything. Yeah. It's just yeah. 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 And I don't know if you've seen Kodiak stuff, Trish, but Kodiak is a company that used to be the old crow, which does a lot of financial yeah. um metrics for groups. Uh, what do they have more than like they have like half the hospitals. And they were saying like uh Claim submission cash or cash coming back in was down more than 50% over their whole part, which isn't all change, right? They don't all have change clearing houses. So think about that for a minute. Like it's that's significant. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, like Ben said, I mean, um, it was, it was finally, you know, um, the Kaufman Hall publishes uh, health system margins and uh, the end of 2023 hospitals were back to a 2% margin, which it's actually decent for hospitals. Which was way better. It's a, po than it's a positive it's number. Positive, it's a positive number. Yes. It's a little bit of margin. You know, it's on average. So we do have, we still have, you know, a lot of health systems struggling. Uh, they're not for profits. And, uh, and then, you know, then, then this hits and yeah, this is, you know, this is significant and, um, you know, vendors coming in. So I think, you know, the vendors that are in rev cycle, I mean, they're, you know, they're on the phone with providers, <laughs> every day right now because there's you know impacts you know if you're even if you're like an ancillary rev cycle you do contract management you need to claim files so you you know you really have a pulse on what's going on um you know the vendors that do ocr for paper remittances they're getting you know they're getting phone calls hey we need help the clearing houses so the rev cycle vendors have a strong sense of what's going on um, but the vendors that aren't close to rev cycle Providers aren't going to be calling them back, right? They're going to be too busy. They're they're not going to get, be getting back to them, and um, you know, they need to know that you know there's a there's a crisis going on right now, and until the crisis settles, providers aren't going to be in a position to you know buy new technology, implement to new yeah. technology, really focus on innovation. I think the only things that are going to be a focus for a health system right now in terms of buying. Uh, for the you know next couple of months is going to be you know anything that's cybersecurity related, and then anything that's compliance related, anything that they have to do is going to be the focus. Yeah. So there, there it is. I mean, if we're going to sum it up, that's for the, those who are affected by this uh, this deal. That's going to be the the order of the day. So we just need to be aware of that moving forward, and knowing that 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 what this has signaled to the entire ecosystem is a pretty high alert around cybersecurity, around really looking at how data is being handled and who has the opportunity to access and and uh, where where the vulnerable points might be. Um, I think that that's going to be an increasingly important thing. We're about at time here. I'm really wanting to make sure. So what what's very apparent to me and I'm sure to the rest of the folks listening is that we've got a wealth of insight around this uh, this area sitting in this uh, little interview here. So I want to make sure that our audience knows where to get a hold of you both. Mm -hmm. So if we could just kind of reiterate that. I know I talked about it at the front end, but Trish, if... Uh, Somebody's wanting to find you. What are the good places to do that? Sure. So, um, so you know, reach out on LinkedIn. 
and um, you know, I have a website, so Eliciting Insights. There's, um, you know, if you want to get a copy of the Market Pulses, you can certainly download them. And there's a, you know, contact form on the website, you know, or just send an email to info at elicitinginsights.com. And uh, yeah, I would love to hear from you. And Ben, how about you? Uh, probably similar. I'm obviously I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on there. I try to be honest and give <laughs> real, uh, thoughts and what I think is happening on there. I have a unique perspective, I'd say, cause I'm kind of in the middle of these things. Um, I have a community of providers. Um, they can also find me tarpon.health. Um, if they're interested in tarpon at all, but, and then I have a podcast called my good friends, which is available on iTunes and Spotify. Awesome. And do some other things to this. Very good. Well, Ben and Trish, I really appreciate you uh, kind of giving us the rundown here. It's a tricky moment. Um, and it's going to be uh, certainly a lot, a lot of folks very interested in how this continues to work itself out and what the downstream implications will continue to be and how the world's going to change. So we'll probably double back with you guys in, in a little while and uh, <laughs> see what has become of this all, because let's hope that it finds itself to a better, to a better spot than where it is, um, because it needs to, right? Mm hmm Thanks for joining us today and uh, really grateful for your perspective. Mm -hmm.